It's the year 2040. You've finished up work early at office and are now headed home. As your self-driving car glides smoothly on the roads of San Francisco, your smart glasses flicker to life. <laughs> and they start playing the day's breaking news. Elon Musk just landed on Mars. As the car reaches your home, you glance up and you see a drone is delivering your day's groceries. You step inside your house and a humanoid robot greets you with your favorite beverage and a bowl of freshly cut fruits. This is the future and it's already unfolding. There's just one problem. Your homes would not have enough energy to power any of it. If you buy just one electric vehicle and one humanoid robot, your household energy consumption will triple. Add electric heating and cooling, quadruple. Generating this energy isn't the problem. The problem lies in transmission. Our electricity grid was created 130 years ago for a world where a radio and a couple of light bulbs were the household norm. You see, the grid is like a highway for electricity. And the problem right now is this highway is too narrow to handle the future energy demand. So why don't we just widen the highway? Add a few more transmission lines. Technically, we can. It's just unbelievably expensive and painfully slow. Upgrading the US grid alone would cost us five trillion dollars. That's nearly a hundred times the annual budget of Department of Energy. And money isn't even the biggest problem. Acquiring land, erecting poles, laying down transmission lines, it takes decades. Beyond the dollars and the delays, there's also something deeper that we don't talk a lot about. For most of the world, access to transmission lines defines destinies. I have lived this reality. I grew up in Langarpura, a remote village in northern India, about a thousand kilometers east of Delhi. My family was one of the few in Langarpura that owned a television. But for most of my childhood, it was nothing more than an expensive stand for flower pots. My village lacked electricity. There were only two occasions when the TV was ever switched on. First, my aunt was getting married. Second, when India was playing the Cricket World Cup Finals <laughs> in 2003. And the entire village pooled money to just watch that match. And as some of you may know, weddings and cricket matches are a really big deal in India. <laughs> Growing up without electricity isn't just about inconvenience. It's about missing out on education, opportunity, access to the modern world. There are still 650 million people who are waiting for transmission lines to arrive. And even for places where it has arrived, it's not reliable. My village is now connected to the grid, but we still receive just eight hours of electricity. At the peak of the Indian summer, when the temperature reaches 120 degrees, they cut the power. Because transmission lines are likely to snap off and cause fires. It starts to rain, they cut the power. It gets a bit windy, they cut the power. The only time we receive 24 hours of electricity is right before the elections. <laughs> I wonder why. But last summer, Things changed. India was once again playing the Cricket World Cup final, but this time we watched it on our TV. No diesel generators, no pooled village savings. How? We just stopped relying on transmission lines. Rooftop solar and batteries have completely transformed my village. Every house now has its own power source right on its roof. 
We don't wait for electricity to travel a thousand miles. We generate it right where it's needed. When I started speaking to people in the US energy sector, I was very surprised. They were also struggling with the same problem. How do we add more transmission lines? But why are we trying to force an old technology that was meant to take us from candles to light bulbs to now power electric vehicles and humanoids? It doesn't make sense. For over a century, our energy systems have been designed with one central assumption. Power must be generated far away and then transmitted over vast distances before it reaches our homes. And for most of our history, that assumption made sense. Small power plants weren't efficient enough, and you couldn't build a massive power plant in the middle of the city, so you built them outside. But that assumption is no longer valid. Solar has completely changed the game. Whether you install a few panels on your home or a million panels in the desert, the fundamental efficiency is exactly the same. And we have seen this change before. When computers were first created, they had the exact same problem. Processing was logged in massive mainframes, just as energy is logged in massive power plants. We access computers through telephone lines, just as we access power plants through the grid. There were massive inefficiencies, congestions, lags. So what did we do? We miniaturized semiconductors and started putting them at the edge, in our homes, in our personal computers, in our phones. It's time to do the same for energy. With the falling cost of batteries, solar, and smart grid technology, we have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to build a truly decentralized energy ecosystem, one where homes produce, store, and consume power locally only occasionally relying on the grid. Yet every time I present this idea, I hear the same doubts. What happens when the sun doesn't shine? Well, decentralization doesn't mean disconnection. In fact, it'll give you more options. If you need extra energy, you could either buy it from your neighbor, who may have excess energy stored in their battery, or you could buy it from the grid where it'll come from solar, nuclear, geothermal, or any large power plant. These large plants won't disappear. They'll still be used for industrial applications and sometimes for grid balancing. But what about the economics? Isn't decentralization too expensive? That argument was true a decade ago. Today, solar is the cheapest form of energy in human history. And thanks to innovative financing, you can practically get batteries for free. But the utilities will never allow it. They'll always see this as an existential threat to their model. They don't have to see it that way. Their model will evolve. Instead of charging per kilowatt hour, they'll start charging a subscription fee. Just as you buy a monthly data plan for your phone, even though you mostly rely on Wi-Fi, You'll now buy a grid subscription plan for your home, even though you mostly rely on solar and batteries. This won't be the end of utilities. It'll just be the beginning of their next chapter. So if the technology is ready, and the economics makes sense, and utilities have a path forward, what's holding us back? Doubts. And doubts don't build the future. Decentralization would not happen overnight. And it's too big for any one company, organization, or individual to solve alone. But all of us together can. That's why I urge you, if you own a home, install solar. If you invest, bet on it. If you work in policy, please push for faster approvals. Because the future we are all building depends on it. And if we don't fight for the future, who will? Thank you.